You'll open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 22. We uh, did a little preview of this on Wednesday night, and then um, we, we talked about uh, worrying, and, and that's been on my, my mind a, a lot this week, uh, this subject of worrying. And I've, I've talked to a couple of yoke fellows about it and their wives, and uh, we've come to the conclusion, conclusion that we ought not do it. And that would be the end of the sermon, wouldn't it? We just ought not do it. But boy, isn't that difficult? Isn't that difficult? What, what I want you to, to see from today's message is this. Last week, we talked about a, a guy who said to Jesus, Lord, would you, would you tell my brother to give me my share, my fair share of the inheritance? And Jesus saw the greed and selfishness in his heart. And Jesus told the parable of the man who, who had so much, I mean, God had just bestowed his grace on him so much, and he had so much grain that he didn't know what to do with it, so he decided to build bigger barns, and then he died that night. That lesson was about people who are trying to get ahead, you know, that, but today's lessons is about people who are just trying to get along. I don't know which one you fit in, but a lot of us fit in this category of, of just trying to get along. I mean, let's make it through today. And uh, we're not as bad off as some people. Did you see that lady? I mean, part of her punishment may have been she had a Texas shirt on, but... Uh, these sweeping dirt out in front of our house. We don't do that. Wondering if we're going to have enough food to have a meal tomorrow. We, we don't worry about that. We look at our refrigerator to see what it is we need to throw out that we haven't eaten. And, and not many people are in this getting by, just getting along deal. Life was hard in these days in Palestine. And it was as difficult in Palestine when Jesus is talking about this than it, than it was in, in Tanzania or Zambia where we saw the film today. But Jesus isn't talking to the crowd He's talking to his disciples. And he says to his disciples, he says, listen, as long as you're in the ministry, there's going to be people who are just trying to get by. They're just trying to get along. And here's some principles that you need to understand as you deal with those people. Listen, listen to what he says as we begin looking here in verse 22. Well, let's look at verse 21 first, okay? He said to his disciples, let me find the verse. Well, it's verse 22. He said to his disciples, therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, Jesus, Jesus kind of narrows it down here. First of all, he, he's talking to his disciples, and he says, uh, therefore. Well, we've got to find out what it's there for. Worry is a besetting sin. Someone said it, it's, it's the silent sin. We never criticize anybody for worrying. You never hear anybody judging anybody because they're worrying. We're just made to worry. And we, we fit into that category. But the Bible categorizes it as a sin. Someone says, but preacher, I'm just a worry wart. Well, that's a sin. We've got to learn to overcome that. Remember back in the 70s, very popular song, didn't say much, but it said this, don't worry, be happy. That's all I can remember of that song. I tried it and it don't work. 
Don't worry. Be happy. I fit more with this song back in the 60s. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now. But the way things are going, I won't be worried long. You know, that, that's more how I fit. But Jesus says to his disciples, listen, you're going to face people and they're going to be worried about food, what they eat. They're going to be worried about their fitness, how long they're going to live, how they feel. They're going to be worried about fashion, what they're going to wear, what other people are going to think about what they're wearing. They're going to be worried about finances. If you're going into the ministry, that's the group you're going to deal with. They're going to be worried about all of these things. You see, I wrote some notes down about 3 o'clock this morning. And added them to my message because uh, I was worried a little bit. And I said, Lord, i got to preach on not doing this. And here I am doing it. It's three o'clock in the morning. I ought to be asleep. And, and, and here's what comes to me. A, a warrior is torn between the real and the possible. What really is going on? The, the immediate and the potential. A, a warrior attempts to live in the future. And that's foolish because the future's not here. And the future doesn't belong to us anyway. And a warrior superimposes the future on the present. The Lord forces us to think about worry and and why we should not worry. So, so I've written down several things, and, and I just want to go through the Scripture with you. And, and, and if you're a worrier, are you a worrier? Don't, you don't need to raise your hand. But if you're a worrier, you say, yes, I am, because you are. You worry about something. We all do. But if you're a worrier, here's some truths about that. If you, are, if you worry, remember life is more than food, fitness, fashion, or finances. Life is more than that. We, we need to understand that. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to put on. Don't worry about your body. Life is more than that. If you worry, you miss the real meaning of life. That's number two. Look at verse 23. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. God's reason for our existence and God's purpose for us here is much more important than eating and dressing well. I, I did a funeral Friday of a lady who was a member of the church when I, when I first came here and very vibrant lady back then, and, and, and I saw her over the years as she had a stroke, and, and it became more and more difficult for her to get along and then not to come to church. And she was a great sports fan. I mean, she was, she was born in Las Vegas in 1930, so she's a true native, and she was a true Rebel fan. She had season tickets to the basketball game, to the football games, and went to every baseball game. Great sports fan. So as, as I did her funeral, and I remembered that, and, and I remembered that I couldn't go to a sporting event of UNLVs without seeing her. And back in the day when the crowds were so large and it was hard to get a ticket to see the basketball team play, it just seemed like if I was fortunate enough to get a ticket to go, the first person that I'd run into would be Betty Keston. As I did her funeral, I, 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 I was just, when I go through funerals, I try and think of the person and their lives and, and God's purpose for their lives and God's purpose maybe in their death. And after the funeral, I'm headed to my car 
And a lady who works for the funeral home stopped me and she said, this may not be the appropriate place to ask you this, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. And I said, uh, okay. She said, do you really believe there's life after death? She said, I work for this funeral home. She said, dead is dead. But I hear you preachers say, there's a resurrection. Where is this lady? Where is she right now? So I was able to share with her from John 8, 4. She's in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. It might be four or eight, but one of those verses. And I said, have you ever really heard the story of Jesus? She said, I've heard all about Jesus. I said, but have you heard that he arose from the grave? She said, well, I can tell that I don't have enough time to talk to you. And I said, no, you don't. So I gave her one of my cards. I said, call me. We'll talk about this. But, but you see, the world doesn't understand this. Life is more than eating and drinking and dressing up and, and partying. Life is more than that. Life is, is, as Barry said a while ago, life is being at peace with God. And when you're at peace with God, you can have the peace of God in your life. If you worry, remember God feeds the birds. And he'll be sure to feed you. David said, I was once young, now I'm old. And I've never seen a child of God begging for bread. Consider the ravens. Now, last week we considered the sparrows. And the sparrows were worth how much? Two for a penny. And five for two pennies. I mean, that's, that is pretty... I mean, I mean, the value of a sparrow is pretty low. But consider the ravens. You couldn't buy one. You couldn't... I mean, you, you might could buy one if you're foolish enough, but nobody would even attempt to sell you one because ravens are scavengers and they're unclean birds and they're totally worthless. They have no value at all. And it says, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn. Now, ravens aren't examples of idleness. They're examples, really, in this passage of Scripture, of the absence of anxiety. God provides food for them, and they go get it. Now, tell me the truth. If, I, if I've told all of you the story of the, the dead crows in Massachusetts, did I tell you that story? I'm going to tell you because just recently, they, on the interstate there in Massachusetts, they found 200 dead crows. And, and they thought it was the avian disease, you know, the bird flu. But they called in a pathologist and he examined, he said, no, these birds didn't die of bird flu. They, they were hit by vehicles. They called in an orthologist to, to come in and look at them. And he said, yes, they were. They were hit by vehicles. And 196 of them were hit by trucks. Only four were hit by cars. And he could tell by the paint residue on them and on their beaks. Somebody asked him, said, why would, why would more be hit by trucks than by cars? And he said, well, that's a good question. There's as many cars on the road as there are trucks. This old man was listening to them, sitting beside the road. He said, I'll tell you why. 
He said, crows, when they when they they're they're scavengers, and when they're eating roadkill, they always have one crow on lookout. He's sitting on a pole or up in a tree, and he's on lookout to warn the other crows of vehicles coming. And everybody knows that the only thing a crow can say is ka. You never heard a truck come out of a crow's mouth. They neither sow nor reap. God feeds these worthless creatures. Oh, how much more value are you? What makes us valuable? See, see we, we're talking to believers here. We are children of the King. What makes us more valuable? We're children of the King. Of much more value are you than the birds. Listen, I don't know of a farmer that will not go out in the barnyard and feed his chickens. And, and, and that farmer that takes the time to go feed his chickens certainly takes the time to put food on the table for his children. They're much more valuable than the chickens. And God says, listen, if I'll take care of the raven, which is a worthless creature, I'll just take care of my children. You see, someone said, worry well, I'll tell you, I read this from McLaren last night. I have, I have the old McLaren commentaries. They were written back in the, in the early 50s. And McLaren says this. He says, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it does empty today of its strength. It does not make you escape the problem. It makes you unfit to deal with it when it comes. God gives us the power to bear all the sorrow of his making. But he does not guarantee to give us strength to bear the burdens of our own making, such as worry induces. Do you see what, what McLaren is saying? Hey, listen, you and I need to believe the promises of God and doubt the negatives of worry. God didn't give you the strength to deal with that. But he did give you the strength to deal with real problems that he has allowed to come your way. Yesterday in the men's fellowship, Brother Warren talked about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, verse 6 says, and he shall direct thy paths. You see, God will be with us through everything that he leads us into. But God's not going to lead us into worry. Verse 25 teaches us that if we worry, we need to remember that we can't extend the length of our life. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature. That, that very phrase there can be translated and, and probably is in some of the modern translations. Which one of you can add to your lifespan? Last night I was reading my Bible and, and I finished up and, and uh, it was about, about 11.30 and I went in to uh, get a drink of water and, and sit down just for a moment before I went to bed. And I felt my, 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 my felt like I, I had a, a toothache. And um, so I, I just felt my face like you do when you have a toothache. And I felt the cancer that has gone to my face. And, and it, it's right there. And I, I felt that. And I thought, that thing's growing. I wonder how long I got. 
I, you know what I, what, what I had been doing all evening is studying about worrying. And just before I went to bed, what was I doing? Worrying. Now, I'll, I'll tell you this. Worry will not add a second to your lifespan. It might take a second or two away. It might take a year away. It might take it two years away. Worry won't do that. You can't, you can't add to your lifespan by worry. And so God spoke to me and, 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 and he said, listen, you, you can't enjoy life that I've given you if you're going to worry about how long it's going to be. Live it. So I would like to tell you I went to bed and slept soundly. I didn't. It was four o'clock that I finally said, okay, I'm going to live it. You see, worry robs us of two things in life. Those who worry, John Hopkins University did a study and said we don't know why, but people who worry do not live as long as people who worry less. So worry can shorten our life. But I think that I, I think the worst part of this is that worry keeps us from enjoying the abundant life that God gives us. So the truth really is, at about 4 o'clock this morning, the truth came to me, you cannot live by faith and worry. You just can't do that. And, and, and that's what he's saying here. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his stature or, or one second to his lifespan? Worry is an exercise in futility. Look at verse 26. If you're not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? You waste your time and, and you waste your energy. Verse 27 says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, when he, when he talks about lilies here, he's talking about the day lilies of the, of the uh, Middle East. And, and they, they almost grow up overnight, kind of like a cactus flower. They, they just kind of grow up overnight, and they don't last very long. They, they're, they're beautiful, but they only last for about a day. And then the women go out and cut them down, pull them up, and they use them to start fires to, so that they can cook their meal. These beautiful flowers are here for a moment. And then they're gone. The Indians of Oklahoma said, you know, life is like a buffalo's breath on a cold morning. You see it, and it's gone. And God dresses these lilies so beautifully. When I thought about that, I thought about in the springtime, you know, it's so dry out here, but in the springtime when we get our first rains, drive out into the desert, and, and the desert is just filled with desert flowers. They're only there a few days. So if it rains, you better get in the car and go. But God makes them so beautiful. God does that. And, and the, the truth is, if God really is concerned about daylilies and desert flowers, God is concerned about you. If you worry, you exhibit a lack of faith. If a man... Or, or if then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Anxiety, worry about material things shows how little we trust in God. Boy, this hurts. I'm preaching to myself, okay? 
But, but I, I want you to hear my sermon to me. How much faith do you have? You can measure your faith by your worry, by your anxiety. The greater the anxiety, the less the faith. The more faith, the less the anxiety. Well, what does the Bible say about that? The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you try and deal with worry by fretting, you're just going to increase the worry. And God is in, in, in telling us, listen, the way to deal with worry is to, to praise me, to thank me, and to heed my word. Increase your faith. If you worry, you set your heart on tangibles instead of on trust. Do, do not uh, seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Now, I want to say something to you about this. This is not a suggestion. Jesus isn't suggesting that you stop worrying about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and, and, and what you're going to have in the bank. This is a command. It's an imperative. Do not be anxious. Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink nor have an anxious mind. Do not do that. All of nature depends on God. And God doesn't fail nature. Only man depends on material things. And material things always fail us. Only man depends on money. And then the stock market crashes. There's a black Tuesday. All, all of man that depends on his health. And then the computer crashes and he can't sign up for health care. All of man depends on how he looks to determine how he feels. But then a fire comes and burns all of our clothing and all of our possessions. Material things fail us. We must choose to trust God. And when we choose to trust God, those things that are, are, are beyond our control, God takes control. You see, really what worry says is, Lord, I don't believe you can handle this, so I'm going to try and take care of it myself. But the Bible says nothing's impossible with God. He can handle our cares. But whenever you start to feel anxious, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your care on him because he cares for you. One of my favorite scripture verses is Psalm 46, 1. The Lord is my strength, my fortress, a very present help in the time of trouble. Now, if the Lord is of a very present help in the time of trouble, if I decide to worry, I'm on my own. You see, I just need to say, Lord, take care of this. You're in charge of this. Because if I decide I'm going to worry about it, God says, hey, you're on your own. When we do that and we worry, we're like unbelievers. We refuse faith in God. For these things the nations of the world seek after. Pagan unbelievers focus on material things for themselves. That's what the lost does. And your father knows you have need of these things. You see, the Bible says that my God shall supply all of your needs. Say that word, need. All, so God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. Do you know what we've done? 
most of most of the people I know, most of the friends I have, we have made luxuries needs. I need a 60-inch flat screen TV. I need a Grand Cherokee Jeep. I need some luxury. And we have, we have put luxuries in the place of, of needs. Now, I want you to remember that because Jesus is going to have something to say about that in just a moment. But I want you to remember that. Look at the next verse. It, it says, you're not making God's kingdom your priority. He says, but seek, focus on the kingdom of God. That's the present reign of God. And all these things shall be added to you. All of what things? Not your luxuries, but all of your needs, your food, your shelter, your clothing. All of that will be added to you if you focus on God. What does that mean, seeking the kingdom of God? It means to allow God to meet my personal needs. You see, I'm more apt to give thanks for what I have if I realize it is God who gave it to me. You say, wait a minute. No, you're not making sense. And, and, and I'm looking back at my notes. Seeking the kingdom of God means to achieve the meeting of our material needs. And, and, and you say, wait a minute, according to what you've been saying, that doesn't make sense. But isn't the Christian life usually opposite of what the world teaches us? You see, we gain our life by losing it. We lead by serving and we have our material needs met by not worrying about them. That's the Bible way. We don't worry about our material needs. We just worry about living in God's presence, practicing the presence of Christ, being God conscious. If you worry, you're forgetting what the Father's already given you. Look at the next verse. Do not fear. Do you know, worry is not fear, but, but fear manifests itself in worry. Think about that. Fear makes itself known through worry. So do not fear, little flock. Wait a minute. Children? Christians worry? Of course they do. Don't do that. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The antidote to fear is faith. I'm inwardly fashioned by faith, not by fear. Stanley Jones said this. He said, fear is not my native land. Faith is. I'm, I'm so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. Worry is not my native Air. Faith. The just shall live by faith. If you worry, you're thinking more of yourself than of others. I say, I, 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 I wanted to tell you I saved this to last, but Jesus saved it to last. And I'm going to come down on your level now because this is really going to hit you in the big toe. Listen to what he says. This is dangerous. Sell what you have. Whoa. 
How many signing up for that? You're going to sell all you have. My hand went down. Sell what you have. Listen to what it says. And give alms. Who, who begs for alms? The guys out here on the street, the poor. Sell what you have, and I'll guarantee you, you won't walk very far until it's gone. If you give it to the poor. And where are we going to find you next week? Out there, we're going to have to be selling what we got to give to you. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Uh, you know, thieves break through and steal, and, 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 and we, unemployment steals from us. Recession steals from us. Our, our health problems steal from us. Natural disasters steal from us. Do you know they're having more earthquakes in Oklahoma than they are in California? My sisters don't like it. That's not supposed to be. I, I think the big one was yesterday when Oklahoma beat Oklahoma State. I think there was a, a rumbling around Stillwater there and, and everything. So I, I think there was a big one there. You see, Jesus is telling us that the crucial issue in life is not the amount of our treasure, but it's the location of our treasure. Now, let's go back to this thing of, of I have certain needs. I, I have a need to, to be clothed. I have a need for food. I have a need for shelter. And God says, don't worry about that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're to sell everything that we have and become poor in order to help the poor. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, take around a look around. Look at the household of faith, the people in the church. What is it that you have that is not a necessity, that is a luxury, and, and you really only have it to impress people that you could have it? Kind of like the lady that went down and bought a Mustang convertible. She was in her 60s, and, and she, she just got a Mustang convertible with all of the stuff on it and everything and always wanted a convertible and went, went and bought her one and spent big bucks on it. And they got it all cleaned up and got it ready for her to go, and they signed all the papers, and she paid cash for it, and she gets in it and getting ready to drive away. And the guy said, hey, wait a minute. You haven't let me show you how to let the top down. Don't you want me to do that? And she said, heavens no. I'm not going to put the top down. He said, but you bought a convertible. She said, do you think I spend $50 a week at the beauty shop having my hair fixed? You think I'm going to ride around in a car with the top down? He said, well, lady, why did you buy a convertible? I wanted people to know I could. Do you know what? There's a lot of stuff in our lives that we have just to impress people. Not, not for any other reason. It's just to impress people. It's not an investment. It's, it's of no earthly good to us. It's just something that we have. And Jesus said, hey, listen, why don't you sell that and give it to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? Why don't you sell that and give it to the uh, Food for Hungry, the, the Baptist Global Relief Fund? Why don't you sell that and help that friend in church who needs new tires on their car? Why don't you do that? That's what he's saying. He says, because if you're worrying about that stuff, you are treasuring the temporal over the eternal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. You know, canceled checks, credit card receipts, that shows a person's values. That shows our priorities. I, I, I want to share with you today, we, we saved the offering to the end because I wanted you to have this thought on your mind as we give. Heaven is scarcely a reality to the man or the woman who is not prepared to invest cold, hard cash, if you will, to invest in its interest. And I think by the same token that heaven becomes real to the person that says, I believe in God's work. And, can, and since I've gone over time already, can I be a little bit more personal? Yes, I can. As a Christian, it's the church that ministers to you. It just is. And I think it's sad, folks. I, I'm just being personal about this. No scripture verse involved here. But I think it's, I think it's sad that when a Christian dies... that we say to the people, give to the American Cancer Fund. Give to the Diabetic Fund. Give to uh, Children's Abuse Fund or whatever. You know, I'll guarantee you, nobody from the cancer organization came and visited you in the hospital. And unless you found one Christian in a, among that bunch, not a one of them prayed for you. Not a one of them thought of you. Not a one of them really said an encouraging word to you. It's the church. And when there's a death in your family, I think you ought to, in honor of the person, make a gift to missions. Make a gift to the church. You see, when we don't do that, we're actually saying, well, the church is the place I go. It really doesn't have much meaning. It doesn't do much. We show how much we love the Lord by what we invest our money in. So now you have an opportunity to invest your money in the work of God as we take our offering. Men, will you come, please? Father, most of us would be lying, but only to ourselves if we said we didn't worry. Father, our faith in you is so small. Help us grow in faith. And Lord, let it be seen through the way we praise you, the way we talk about you, in the way we give to you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Normally we have you stand when we take an offering. So that, you know why we do that? So the men can get to their wallets. Uh, but we feel you can get to that. So fellas, if you will, just take the offering, please.
Uh, just a little word of update, so I don't tell this story a whole bunch of times, and and to do that, Margie and I will be going to uh, California tomorrow, and uh, we'll be going to the uh, Angeles Cancer Clinic, and there uh, go through an evaluation and consultation, and may have to stay a few days uh, for treatment. We we don't know what the outcome of that's that's going to be. And uh, then just to let you know, uh, we will be back Sunday, if, if the Lord's willing. But then we're going to take a couple of weeks off. And uh, we're, uh, just take, we, we've not done that for a while. And we're going to do that. So if I'm not gone, don't, don't send flowers to my house, okay? Uh, don't do that. Because we're, we're, this is a planned trip. And if the Lord allows it, we're going to do that. Appreciate all of you. And I want to end today. We're not going to stand and give an invitation for you to come forward. But I, I do want to give an invitation to you. Whatever it is that you're worried about, give it to God. And if you're worried about, the la- like the lady at the cemetery, if you're worried about what happens after you die, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Believe that He is the Son of God that he died, was buried, and rose again. And his resurrection is our guarantee of a resurrection. For the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Don't leave here without Jesus. Let's stand, please. Brother Glidewell, I was going to have you pray for the offering, not for God. Will you dismiss us in prayer, please? Thank you.